So at this point, over the last five episodes, we've already explored all of the ride and resort announcements for Disney World in Florida, as well as a few projects that are almost surely happening but haven't been discussed publicly yet. Today, we begin to explore the California Resort. Disneyland has the largest number of attractions at any Disney park in America, so it's California Adventure that needs the most improvements. This is also a park that's moving through a multi-year identity shift from its original conceit as presenting the various landscapes and cultures of California to a park that now is largely arranged around intellectual properties fused in places with California. California landscapes, from San Francisco to Pixar Pier to Avengers Campus and so on. That trend of focusing IP-based lands, not unlike Hollywood Studios out in Florida, will surely continue into the next four or five years with some of the recent announcements playing into that identity shift. But before we jump in, I need to thank another round of recent Bandcamp subscribers. We're an ad-free, listener-supported podcast, so these are the people who keep this whole enterprise going. Gratitude today is going out to Amaretz Fan, Daniel, 1313 South Harbor, and Abigail. Thanks to each of you and to all of our Bandcamp subscribers for supporting what we do here. And now we have a lot to explore today. So, if you're ready, let's go. This episode will be entirely focused on DCA and the range of projects coming to that park. We'll start with the Avatar area. Previously, we could assume that the new Avatar area would be themed to the second Avatar movie, The Way of Water. But we now know that it will also have touches of the third film, which will be called Fire and Ash. So the Avatar films as a set of ecological narratives are moving through different biomes. The first film was focused on communities that live on the land. The second was focused on communities that live on or near the water. And the third likely will be focused on communities that live near fire or volcanic regions of Pandora. The fire and ash elements may be more part of the ride experience inside the show building, as exterior elements, as best we can see, are largely focused on water regions. So what will all of this look like when built? In the new Imagineering artwork, it appears that there are a few buildings and a few path areas. Assuming that WDI reuses the basic plan from Pandora at Animal Kingdom, it seems likely that one building there will be a restaurant and another a store. There also appears to be a set of outdoor walking trails, including a bridge over the water area. There is a grayed out area at the side of the artwork that is likely the location of the large show building. There also appears to be an enclosed portal, sort of like the Grand Avenue entrance to Galaxy's Edge at Hollywood Studios in Florida, taking you from the world as we know it into the world of Star Wars, though of course here it would take you into the world of Avatar. But here's the interesting thing in the art. The tall mountain spires are all on the upper right-hand side of the artwork, and likely those mountain spires are designed as a visual barrier to block out some structures that exist outside of the land. Here's what we already know. This avatar experience will go in at DCA, and if those spires are designed as a visual barrier, I think that there's only a few likely spaces where this land could go. If this land is earmarked for the expansion pad that is presently the downtown Disney parking lot, those spires are likely designed to block out either the Disneyland Hotel or the Pixar Place Hotel. But here's something else we know. There are at least multiple partial models of the lagoon area with the conical rock spires. If you want to see what the whole area layout looks like, just take a look at our cover art for this episode. It's there. At D23, we did not see an entire plot model as we did for Tropical Americas at Animal Kingdom, 
nor did we see a full model for any individual structure, such as for the Ancanto Casita. But the Avatar area in California was one of the few new land announcements that came with any model work at all which suggests that this area is actively moving through development. In another episode, we talked about the possibility of the track course model for the Monsters, Inc. door coaster being at least partially attached to a previous version of that ride. So this leaves only two land announcements at D23 with definite new model work. The Avatar area in California and the Tropical Americas area in Florida. So let's extend out this discussion with that information. It will take a while, likely many years, to develop the two large expansion pads by Downtown Disney and the Disneyland Hotel into usable space for a theme park. There needs to be an alternate parking area built, plus bridges across Disneyland Drive, which at times is still known by its old name West Street, plus upgraded infrastructure, particularly electricity and water to support complex rides, and the thousands and thousands of people who will visit these areas each day. In looking now at how this land is being developed with some fairly detailed models, I don't think that this land is being actively considered for one of those parking lot expansion pads. If this land was being developed for one of those expansion pads, I doubt we'd see models of any kind at this point. But since we have models, I think we're looking at something that's being planned for an area inside the existing park. The other space that we've talked about for the Avatar expansion is the Hollywood backlot area at the end of Hollywood Land, plus much of the transportation area behind it. So this would be the area presently occupied by the Outdoor Stage, the Monsters Incorporated Ride and Show Building, Stage 12, plus the bus and transportation zones located just outside of the park. There is, of course, one significant issue with this plot plan, and that is that the monorail presently goes through this section of the park. The monorail track could be shifted closer to Disneyland or maybe hidden by some of that elaborate rock work that will be inside of the Avatar area. But still, I think this is a likely location. As other areas in the park move to IP themes, such as San Francisco, Hollywood Land now feels somewhat out of touch with the park's new identity, which is becoming a set of mini lands focused around individual IP. And as a side note here very quickly, if I had to take some off-the-cuff guesses as to what is coming to the remaining California locations inside DCA, I'd guess a Coco theme might be coming to Paradise Gardens, and possibly as a very long shot, even a Country Bears theme for Grizzly Peak. But more on that in a little bit. But to get back to the main point of this section... I believe that there is room for the Avatar land in the Hollywood backlot corner of DCA, including a very large show building that could be built out in the transportation area just behind the current park. The entrance portal to the Avatar area would then be near the Hyperion Theater, and those spires that exist at the edge of the development would be a visual screen to block out the hotels across Harbor Boulevard. One of the drawbacks to this plan is this. If the Avatar area is put in this corner of the park, the only expansion area would be to further take out more of Hollywood land, slowly moving up toward Buena Vista Street. The first area to go then for an expansion, perhaps for a second smaller attraction, would be the Sunset Showcase Theater, where Mickey's Philhar Magic presently plays, usually to a half-empty house. I would expect any expansions to the Avatar area, assuming that Avatar actually goes here, to stay on this side of the street, as, at least for the near future, Disney still needs that street to create any parade route from one side of the park to the other. Guests could go in and out from that tunnel portal, which would visually screen Avatar land from those inside of it from every other section of the park. In terms of an overall park layout and strong transitions from land to land, I'm not sure that this is the most elegant place for the Avatar area, 
But as there was model work for this land at the D23 event, I think this corner of the park is looking like a very likely spot to build it. It's a place that would allow construction to move forward quickly. Avatar 3 Fire and Ash comes out in 2025, so clearly this land would appear after that, likely a long time after that. But I'm guessing before Avatar 4, which is set for a December 2029 release date. There is no announcement of a timeline for the opening of the Avatar experience at DCA, but if construction starts soon, and that is one huge if, and if Disney is looking at the backlot area as opposed to a Disneyland Forward expansion pad, I would guess a likely opening date for this Avatar area might be late 2028 or early 2029, as I'm guessing that there would be a push to open this land before the fourth film installment hits theaters, which will likely have a different environmental location than the second and third films. Construction of the Avatar Pandora area at Animal Kingdom took roughly three and a half years. Consider that it would be the same in California or perhaps slightly longer, as in DCA there would be more demo work involved before construction could actually begin. The next announcement is for a boat ride themed to the Pixar film Coco, which would take guests through the land of the dead, filled with musical skeletons that likely perform songs from the film. Disney made no announcement as to where this boat ride would go, but each fall, typically from August up through early November, DCA hosts a Coco-themed area in the Paradise Garden section called the Plaza de la Familia which includes musical performances from the film Coco, display areas related to the film, and a memory wall to post messages to departed loved ones. The Paradise Garden Grill is also one of the restaurants already focused on Mexican food. So from a thematic perspective, this seems like a pretty natural location for a boat ride inspired by Coco. The entrance, queue, and facade could be inside the current park at the end of Paradise Gardens, with the show building on the other side of the Incredicoaster track. There's some room back there for a mid-sized family boat attraction. Presently on the other side of the Incredicoaster is a very large backstage building, which includes some storage areas for parade floats and some offices. The parade barn section could be smaller and the offices could be moved, but that would give the Coco Ride perhaps as much space as the Toy Story Mania show building, which is also behind the coaster track a little further up the way. And before we move on to the ride itself, let me throw out one other possibility for the show building area, which would be on the other side of Paradise Gardens, presently where Goofy's Sky School now stands. Goofy's Sky School is an off-the-shelf coaster with some unique Disney theming. Off-the-shelf coasters typically have a lifespan of around 25 or 30 years or so. Disney World once had an off-the-shelf wild mouse coaster in Animal Kingdom called Primeval Whirl, which was removed after 18 years. There were some other issues with Primeval Whirl, including the death of cast members. Goofy's Sky School was made by a different company, but it is similar in design to Primeval World. They're both wild mouse coasters. Without significant work, Goofy's Sky School may simply be getting to the end of its natural lifespan. That is to say, the removal of Goofy's Sky School may create another pad where a boat ride show building can be built, though this pad would be smaller than the one behind the Incredicoaster. You could also take out Corndog Castle and some nearby merch areas to create a larger space for a slightly bigger show building. But one of these two areas is the space where I would expect this ride to be placed. The ride itself is clearly an indoor boat ride with a scene from the Land of the Dead. 
Disney has described this as a musical experience. At the D23 presentation, Josh Tomorrow said, We're bringing our skeletal cast of characters to life in a big way through the latest audio animatronics technology. These figures will appear in ways you'll have to see to believe. From there, Disney compared this forthcoming ride to both Pirates of the Caribbean and The Mansion, though I believe this is more in regard to stage arrangements and effects than anything else. The Mansion has illusions, which this ride will have too. Pirates has large stages with a couple of complex animatronics, which this ride will likely have as well. I keep seeing the Coco boat ride described online as a high capacity attraction. But when I look at the one piece of art released so far, I don't see a high capacity attraction at all, nor do I see a vehicle structure for a particularly long ride. I also have heard comparisons from the Coco boat ride to the Tangled boat ride recently opened over in Tokyo, but the seating configurations in these two boat vehicles is very different. The boats for the Tangled ride have four rows for 16 passengers. The art for the Coco ride shows boats with two rows with enough space for up to eight passengers each. These boats for the Coco Ride are far closer in design to those used in Pandora at Navi River Journey, which typically seats six people, though I've seen families with small children push it a little higher. The hourly throughput for Navi River Journey is 1,200 people. And so if the Coco boats have a 33% greater seating capacity, I still think we're looking at a maximum hourly throughput of around 1,600 people, which is less than half of Pirates of the Caribbean's maximum throughput of 3,400 guests per hour. There could be multiple load areas and other not yet revealed elements that offset this throughput figure, but I think the attraction, based on what's pictured, is really on the lower end of attraction throughput at Disney, far closer to Star Tours or the Matterhorn. Or to put it simply, the seating arrangement here is not designed to suck up a large number of people each hour like Pirates or Small World or even the Mansion with its continuously progressing Omnimover track. I think the art suggests that this will be a smaller experience, perhaps with some great effects and lovely music. To throw out one last guess here, assuming the Coco Boat Ride goes into this section of the park, I wouldn't be surprised if some of the structures in the Paradise Garden section took on more of the feel of Santa Cecilia, which is the town where Coco takes place. Sort of like how Pacific Wharf had a light retheme to San Francisco, as the overall impulse in DCA right now is to tie areas to specific film properties. And to be a little more exact, to film properties no more than 30 years old. The last area of the park to receive an announcement has been an area where ideas have been batted back and forth for a while. This area is, of course, Avengers Campus, which still doesn't have a thesis e-ticket attraction to ground the entire area. It has that D-Ticket web shooter ride focused on Spider-Man, and it has a Tower of Terror re-theme focused on the Guardians. But most of the best-known heroes of the MCU are entirely absent from the attractions, including Captain America, Captain Marvel, Iron Man, Hulk, Black Widow, Black Panther, Wanda, and so on. When Avengers Campus opened back in 2021, Disney had planned for a thesis attraction to be built in the building behind the Quinjet. At that time, Imagineer Scott Drake described this attraction as a Quinjet experience in which each traveler is able to move in a unique direction, taking off from Avengers Campus and heading to Wakanda to join other Avengers in the battle there. After your individual flight, Drake added, you'll then rejoin the action on Wakanda where a battle on an epic scale will take place. As seen in the concept art, guests will actually move around in the attraction on their own individual seats as part of the aforementioned individual flight aspect of the attraction. 
So basically, the original idea for this attraction would be a unique simulator experience with a lot of screens in which each person individually had some control over their own movement once they arrived in Wakanda. Since that announcement and then all the secrecy around the project, there was some artwork that was released at Paris Disneyland, clearly for the California park. This may have been an instance in which the right hand of Disney did not know exactly what the left hand of Disney was doing. In the first panel of that artwork, it showed guests arriving to that Avengers building, you know, the one with the Quinjet up on top, and essentially entering into the ride queue. Then, in another panel, it showed guests strapping into flight seats while riding on a transport jet, presumably to Wakanda. The art is cropped in a way so that you can't exactly see how many guests are seated on this jet, each in their own seat with space between them. But it appears to be maybe 8 or 10 guests in this plane. And then in a later panel, you can see that these seats have become a type of jetpack that allow individuals, likely within some predefined movement area, to fly through the battle area once they reach Wakanda. Then in another panel, it shows guests seated in those same flight chairs flying toward a domed city. This almost surely is the domed city of Wakanda. Wakanda has a domed city and then perimeter land around it. It's unclear from the artwork if the flight to the domed city comes before or after that battle. But this generally would have been the narrative flow and also the unique ride system for this attraction. Though the ride system was never announced, it was rumored to be a KUKA robotic arm, one for every chair at least initially, and then in a later version, one for every two chairs. Guests would be seated in the transport, and then at some point, the chairs would separate, or pairs of chairs would separate, and then be docked to a back of a KUKA arm system, or at least this was how I understood it. From here, the ride system would work sort of like Forbidden Journey over at the Wizarding World in Universal. I assume that the plan here would be for the robotic arm to move forward on some sort of motion base or track while giving individual riders, or in that later version, pairs of riders, the ability to move their position up, down, left, and right. Though I should point out that it might also be possible to create the experience of a journey through a series of extremely wide screens, though I don't think that was what was being suggested here. And as a side note, the pair of writer's idea attached to the same robot arm made so much more sense to me, as one of the first things I thought when I saw the original artwork, the one with the individual flying chairs, was... There's going to be a whole lot of very upset 7- and 8-year-olds who are suddenly separated from a parent. The pairs of guests connected to one robotic arm works a lot better. Kids and parents stay together, plus this cuts the number of KUKA arms and presumably track arrangements in half, saving not only cost but more importantly space. And then, a year after this ride, the one focused on jetpack chairs and the Battle of Wakanda was announced, it was scrubbed. In part, this may have had something to do with the difficulty of relaunching the Black Panther franchise in the MCU without its star Chadwick Boseman. But there's one other element to briefly touch on here. One of the possible areas that Disney has suggested for the Disneyland Forward project over on the current downtown Disney parking lot is a Wakanda Miniland, which in super rough and quickly made images appeared to have a large show building. It's possible, let's say that there's a very small chance here, that Disney might try to reuse this attraction concept as it's centered on a journey to Wakanda for the Wakanda area if they actually choose to build a land based on that. It would also give Disney many more years to test and improve the unique ride system that they wanted for this ride, as that appears to be a huge hurdle to make this version of the Avengers ride work. But also, just for the record, I would say that this version of future events, with this ride appearing over as part of the Disneyland Forward project, is not likely because of something else that was announced for Avengers Campus, but give me just a minute to get there. Next, 
Back in 2022, two years ago, Disney executives vaguely announced a replacement experience for the original Avengers Battle for Wakanda ride in which guests now would work with or confront Marvel characters from across time and various universes. So this new attraction, at least initially, would now be a time travel experience through the multiverse and into an alternate realm where Thanos had won his battle against the Avengers, making him into a dark and powerful king. Back in 2022, we received one piece of artwork that showed a three-row ride vehicle with low sides moving past screens where both animated and live-action versions of Marvel characters appeared. For example, there's an animated Spider-Man right next to the live-action version of Thor moving alongside these ride vehicles, which appeared to be similar in design to trackless systems used in other Disney rides. Again, this was all very loose concept art to explain the mood and feel of the forthcoming ride, not to pin down engineering specifics. And then, about a week ago at D23 in August 2024, we finally saw what the ride vehicle would be. It would be a scoop vehicle with high sides and bench seating, which appears significantly different than the art released two years ago. There was even a scale model of it displayed on the Imagineering show floor. It's possible and probably likely that Disney moved from a trackless ride vehicle system to a scoop system, almost surely with a track, as they planned out this ride. And maybe also as they considered exactly how much downtime Rise of the Resistance has and how long that attraction takes to reset. This scoop system is probably similar to the scoop system that Universal uses for Transformers 3D, in which a scoop car mounted to a base moves along a track and that car can tilt and also turn a full circle. The miniature model of the Avengers ride vehicle looks very close, including seat design, lap bar arrangement, platform base, and door alignment to the scoop vehicle made by Oceaneering International that is used over at Universal. I'm guessing that compared to a trackless system, a track-based scoop system is more reliable and easier to maintain. The basic elements of this ride system might be similar, perhaps even identical, to the ride system that Disney recently used for the Neverland Adventure at Fantasy Springs in Tokyo. There was, as I mentioned, a miniature model of the scoop vehicle at the D23 event, so we know that this attraction is reasonably moving through development. At the evening presentation, in the art presented on screen for this new attraction, there appeared to be a storyboard flow-through of the experience. In the queue, guests will pass one of these scoop vehicles, named the Infinity Transport, which appears to have been damaged in a previous battle and is now undergoing repairs. And yes, that sounds a lot like how the Star Speeder is arranged over in the Star Tours queue. Once guests are loaded into a presumably repaired scoop vehicle slash infinity transport, the ride system takes them to various worlds within the MCU to track down King Thanos and return Stark technology that he has stolen for his evil purposes. Typically, scoop rides use a mix of screens and physical props, but most everything in the limited concept art that was presented looked like it used a screen. Screen sections typically show a bunch of characters and action, while physical stages with animatronics tend to feature one or two figures with little drama going on around them. In Rise of the Resistance, for example, the space battles, which hold all of the dense, complex action, are screens, while the sections with Kylo Ren, who typically appears by himself or with one other figure, are mostly physical stages. At least from what we've seen so far, the images for this new Avengers attraction feature a lot of action, which likely means screens, except for the image of King Thanos standing alone on wreckage and holding a single weapon. That pose and the lack of action, and more importantly, the lack of other figures around him, seems to me that it might be a physical set with a physical animatronic.
Its arrangement in the art, that is, the distance from the figure to the ride vehicle, is very much like those in Rise of the Resistance, where physical animatronics are kept many, many feet from ride vehicles. The framing of Thanos here suggests that he will be a similar distance from ride vehicles as Kylo Ren is from cars in Rise of the Resistance. During the attraction experience, the journey takes us from Asgard to New York to Wakanda, perhaps not in that order, where we see Hulk, Black Panther, Ant-Man, and eventually King Thanos. We've been told that Robert Downey Jr. will reprise his role for this attraction, but perhaps that might be limited to the queue area, I don't know. Also gone from the current version, at least in what we saw, were any animated characters. This looks far more like a straightforward journey to find King Thanos through the familiar landscapes of the live-action version of the MCU, and I do think that this concept will probably work better. My guess is that some of the shooting for this new attraction will coincide with the next Avengers film, which is called Doomsday. This production should begin filming mid-year 2025. But there will be a second ride in Avengers Campus as well. And here's where things get a wee bit interesting. This other ride will be placed inside of Tony Stark's lab, where he and his engineers are building and testing new flight equipment. Robert Downey Jr. will again reprise his role as Tony Stark for the pre-show before. And here notice what this all sounds like. Pairs of riders will be placed in side-by-side -side seats, comprising one ride vehicle. The ride vehicles are initially on a track that moves in a half circle until a certain point where a connection is made with a KUKA robotic arm, which docks to the back of their seats and then allows the pair of guests to fly as though they are wearing a jetpack, or in this case have become a superhero like Iron Man. And then, once the flight is over, those chairs are placed back onto the track, which then guides them in another half circle back to the unload area. The artwork makes it seem as though this ride will take up a small space and will be extremely low capacity. If there's just one track with six flight stations, which is what the art shows, I think we're talking about something that might be in the range of 600 people per hour, for a bit of track experience and let's say a 90 second flight. If there are two identical track setups, then 1,200 people per hour, which is still very, very low in Disney standards. But what this looks like overall, and here you can take your pick, is either A, an opportunity to test drive the ride system that was originally arranged for the initial Avengers ride, now scrubbed, so that this system might be used and then refined for a later and longer attraction somewhere else in the Disney ecosystem, or B, a chance to recoup some of the R&D money that was poured into developing the ride system for the original and likely abandon Avengers experience. But generally here, I think that this is a small taste of what writers would have experienced in that original Battle for Wakanda attraction had it been realized. The individual robotic arms can be programmed to present different ride experiences, I'm assuming from mild to extreme. I think I might be leaning a little more toward the mild end of the spectrum. So in the scheme of Avengers Campus, Web Slingers would be a ride to train guests to take part in a battle and this new flight ride with the robotic arm, which is called Stark Flight Lab, is also a training experience to learn how to use Stark technology, presumably so that a guest would be better in a battle. These training experiences, at least in the overall concept for the revised campus, would then prepare guests to take part in Infinity Defense to go up against Thanos. Though, of course, you can ride these attractions in any order you choose. So what's the timeline until all of this opens? The ride with the KUKA arm looks like it'll have a small footprint and a short track path. It will need a new building, but I think that this could be finished quickly. Construction should begin in 2025, 
And from one released photo, it looks like most of the ride system and docking elements have been figured out. There's a possibility, I think, that this could open in 2027, though I'm not sure it would be the wisest thing to do to open a new attraction like this by itself, since so few people would be able to ride it each day. As for the larger ride, construction should begin in 2025 as well. I'm guessing filming for this attraction takes place in 2025 or maybe early 2026, as the production schedule for the next Avenger film allows. I would guess just off the cuff that it would be 2028, possibly late 2028, before Infinity Defense opens at Avengers Campus. I think we're looking at a multi-stage ride, with a ride experience that in terms of design and installation complexity is equivalent to Runaway Railway. At Hollywood Studios, the original Runaway Railway attraction was scheduled to be built in two years but took two and a half. And for that ride, Imagineers reused an existing show building. This new Avengers attraction will require new construction for a very large show building. So three years, maybe a bit longer, that's what I'm thinking. That seems about right to me. Another comparable ride with a unique ride system would be Cosmic Rewind. That took five years to build at Epcot, but it was also deeply delayed due to work safety protocols during COVID. But three to three and a half years seems about right to me for this, but we'll see. I'm sure we'll touch down on progress for this attraction and other DCA attractions many more times in the years ahead. Before I go today, one more thing. I have a video that shows concept art, concept videos, the model of the Avengers ride vehicle, and various water detail models for the Avatar area, so you can see for yourself what is being imagined for this park. As always, the video is up on our landing page, dhipodcast.com. There's also a direct link to that video in our show notes. Next up in our exploration of D23 announcements is Disneyland. It will probably take me a few days to put that together until we finish exploring with nuance and background the announcements from D23. I'm just putting up podcast episodes and videos as soon as I can get them done. So look for that in a few days. Lastly, as you know, we're an ad-free listener-supported podcast. We do just two things. Deep dives on stories related to the history of the Disney studio and the parks, and news and analysis of current events as they relate to the Disney company. We are funded entirely by listener contributions, specifically by listeners who join us over on Bandcamp as monthly subscribers. On Bandcamp, you will find well over 200 episodes not available on iTunes or anywhere else. But the best reason to join us there is to support the work we do here and to make sure that this podcast continues to exist. You can support us by becoming a monthly subscriber at dhipodcast.bandcamp.com. I'll also leave a link down in the show notes. So, until sometime, probably early next week, this is Todd James Pierce.